Welcome, Roots family, to another episode of the Roots Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Pitcher. We are having Casey Thomas on for a part two. Again, he is the director of esports nutrition for 1HP. We're going to really dive in today and how he strategizes fueling for athletes that are in esports, talk about some neurobiology, some supplementation. Uh, definitely very interested in that because these things can be brought across multiple different sports. Um, but Casey, welcome back again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I feel like it went by way too fast last time, so I'm glad that we get to do a second little deeper dive into some of the brass tack stuff. I know you're just having these like just casual conversations, and you know you feel like you've known each other for a long period of time. It's like, oh, here goes 40 minutes. It's already gone by now. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, oh my god, it's already it's already time is up. Okay, <laughs> we just scratched the surface on some of this stuff. Yeah. So let's get started with you know maybe what are some common pitfalls that you see and esports athletes that maybe most dietitians or, or anyone that's possibly going to be getting into working with this, this specific group needs to know about or be aware of? Yeah, there's, there's definitely several issues with this population. And the first one that I'll mention is budget. So this is not something that a lot of people consider, especially if you are used to working in like a hospital or at the collegiate setting or the professional setting or, or you know, any any other formalized um, industry. Esports is very new. So depending on where you're at, there's a huge variance in provisions that are available to these individuals. So most of esports is kind of where traditional sports was several decades ago. Uh, they usually have just one catch-all guy who's like the, oh, I'm, I'm the personal trainer. I'm the psychologist. I'm the doctor. I'm the dentist. I am your team manager. <laughs> I'm going to like do your laundry. Like you just have one catch-all, like you are everything for this person, for this team. And they, they don't really have a traditional, you know, support staff infrastructure set in place. And a lot of times they don't, set up a budget around that they usually will put their budget towards um, other things that they may think are more valuable whether it's like creating merch or content creation or you know promotions or uh, uh, you know getting new you know compounds or whatever for for these people um, so so they're they allocate the budget kind of at a whim almost I would say um, it, it, there's so much uh, staff changeover that where they allocate their budget is usually set up in place and then um, and then they might have like a new guy come in the next season and then like the budget goes completely in different places mm -hmm. so that's that's usually step one is just figuring out what is the budget of this organization this team and what are we allowed to do and on the nutrition side this this really um, I, I've seen it all so uh, just kind of from top to bottom what I've seen is like teams with a, a huge, massive, massive budget. Um, sometimes what they'll have is they'll have like a designated kitchen in their facility with, you know, like a, a chef who's actually there making meals every single day for these individuals. That'd be like a high, high budget kind of situation. Uh, maybe we go down a little bit and what they have is, uh, okay, we have a team manager who's ordering food for the players and we just, you know, Hey, everybody gets this, uh, Boom, there it is. Uh, maybe less than that is like, all right, the players, you get a $10, $15 stipend and you can order whatever you want yourself. Um, and then we'll order it that way. And then, uh, you know, below that is like, okay, we have nothing. Um, or, you know, the players are at home or um, it's like- They're a just collegiate. trying to survive. <laughs> yeah, just trying to survive. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so I think, you know, the, the first pitfall is, is kind of walking in and expecting it to be a certain way just because of your prior experience with a different organization. Uh, and every single team, every single org is, is very different and has very different provisions. And so you can't just like copy paste what you did previously over to every single one. Every single team I've worked with is vastly different. Um, even within the same organization, they might be like, okay, um, so in esports, you might have one uh, parent organization who owns like five different teams. Mm -hmm. And each of these teams, you might think, oh, they're under the same organization. No, no, no. These teams are still going to have entirely different structures and budget allocations and all this kind of thing. So you really do have to do a um, like have, have a very candid conversation on the front end with the organization, just be like, hey, what am I allowed to do? Where where can I work within? Uh, and, and don't copy paste what you did from somewhere else. So that's that's usually pitfall one. Um, and, and that sounds like kind of like a dumb answer because it's not even nutrition related, but but uh, I need to know, okay, am I coordinating with the chef? Am I ordering meals for these players? Am I just doing education sessions? You know, what, what am I actually doing? 
it's like the same, I mean, same thing with schedule and routine. Like if, if you don't have these basic pieces of information, you know, for me to suggest recommendations, how to actually apply this and what you do day in and day out, it's going to be extremely challenging. So it's like, I, I need these details first and you go, and then I can have an approach um, that's going to fit your situation. Cause I know, you know, right where you said a lot of times I'll ask people, what can you do? What, how, what services can you provide? How could you provide value? Yeah. And a lot of times like they may not want to hear like, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to have this conversation. I need to figure out these details. And once I do like, then I can actually give you a better schematic going forward. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, I, I, I could not have said that better actually, because I've had so many of those conversations where a team comes to us and they're like, oh, we're tentatively interested in getting nutrition services or whatever services. And they're like, what can you do for us? And it's like, okay, well, if you have this much money, we can do this. Or if you have a private chef, I can coordinate with them, review menus, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you don't have that. So it's, it's very much like, okay, if this, then that kind of thing. And there's, there's a big user flow, but you have to have that conversation with the admin people on the front end, just so you understand the ongoing structure. And then from there, you can work to implement and meet them where they're at really uh, to, to implement the best thing for them. But yeah, that conversation always has to happen on the front end for any kind of dietitian who wants to enter esports. Uh, I, I made an acronym that I, I use. I call it ease, educate. Ease? Yes. Educate, assess and support. Mm. And then underneath those kind of three different buckets, I then have like possible services or, or things that could be of value to yeah. you as a college, a club team, a high school or an organization, whatever you, whatever you are. And then essentially like, all right, here, here are some options and opportunities based on what your environment schedule routine looks like that I could possibly offer. So then yeah. if you know they want to go sky's the limit and go from zero to a hundred, then I can kind of back them down based off of what they told me and then, and then be able to have a conversation. Well, realistically, based off your budget, based off the teams that are interested, this is where I think we should start. This is where I think we could get to in the next couple of years. And then you'd be big picture thinking if we have the actual resources in place to do, you know, that, that uh, penthouse level type of, of service, right. um, this is what it's going to require before we can essentially get there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that acronym. I might steal that if that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Sherry's yeah. caring. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, for, for, okay, so so talking more specific, you know, nutrition related pitfalls of this demographic, um, the demographic tends to skew very young male um, is is kind of the, the population. Um, a lot of them have zero cooking skills whatsoever. So trying to give them, oh, here's a recipe for you to like do some meal preps at home. It's not going to happen. Like there, there's just no way that that's going to work. Um, they tend to prioritize convenience over everything. And because of that, what you see is a huge reliance on um, things like third-party delivery services, like DoorDash, Postmates, you know, Uber Eats, all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so a lot of them are, are fiends for this, like, time convenience with when it comes to food a lot of them consider eating to be a chore like like truly they're like this is a chore to me and i don't like doing it um so so one it's a chore and then usually two they're also they tend to be very picky with with their taste profiles um and then the third thing that I also mentioned that kind of is in agreement with that actually too is uh in, in na at least in in north america because our contracts tend to pay better, we tend to see a lot of international um, people that we pull in. So we port over a lot of people from different countries uh, to join our teams. And a lot of them, they don't like American food either. So even within a team, usually what you see is that there's this huge variance where it's like, okay, well, one kid wants traditional Korean food. One person wants traditional like Norwegian food. One person is, you know, uh, American wants, you know, hamburger, uh, you know, whatever. So um, you see that there's this huge variance in, in flavor profiles that, that people want. Um, again, limited cooking skills. And then especially with, with the, um, uh, the kids who are, you know, brought over here, uh, they, they don't have like a set up house. Usually they get set up here to, to, to live here. Right. And so for them, they, there's a little bit of an unfamiliarity with, um, you know, how, I mean, like even our outlets are different, right? So like, they just don't, they just don't know how to live in a different country. They, you know, they're unfamiliar with going to the markets, what kind of food's available, what kind of tools are available, all this kind of stuff. So it makes it really tricky. Um, so what I see is uh, that a lot of these individuals rely on um, convenience services. So whether that's meal preps or whether the team has a private chef um, or whether a team has me ordering their meals, uh, it, it's always going to be convenience options. And so um, this can hold players back and more often than not, it does. And 
I've also seen a lot of teams uh, where because the budget is minimal, they might be forced into, they might be pressured into contracts that they don't actually want, mm-hmm. um, which could be to the detriment of the players. So um, I, I was working with one team and they had a contract with a local restaurant and the restaurant gave them this, you know, phenomenal deal uh, where they were able to get two meals a day for like, you know, it was like 20 or 30 bucks, something like that. But this was the only food that the players were allowed to eat or got budget for, for the entire season. So they were eating the same food day in, day out. And they just got, they went miserable because it was a local restaurant. It wasn't like a, like a professional catering service or anything. Um, the, the options were very minimal. It was, yeah, it was just like, all right. It was so repetitive. So, so the players, um, they're like, okay, well, my option is don't eat, uh, do eat, and it's the same thing. Um, choose the unhealthy thing on the menu to switch it up, uh, or I spend my own money out of my own pocket to get something different. And it, it kind of puts this like extra burden on them. Uh, and so I feel bad when they're in those kind of situations. But um, anyway, so so kind of budget, kind of uh, food uh, profile related, um, and then these convenience options and this idea of like a quick fix. Um, what you see is an over-reliance on third-party delivery services as well as supplement products. So um, most teams are, you know, talking about the pitfalls from, from their perspective and from what I see, you know, as a, as a dietitian, um, I, I would say a lot of them are completely unaware of the benefits that nutrition can bring, which I kind of touched on last time. They just don't even know. So usually my early team talks are around like, Hey, here's potential benefits of nutrition. Right. And then from there, uh, what I'll see is usually, uh, pre-scrim pre game, uh, meals are usually really bad. Um, and if we want to talk about neurobiology, uh, there, there's a fun study which showed, um, uh, a lot of these kids, you know, you tell them, oh yeah, eating fried chicken is bad for you. Eating these unhealthy fats is bad for you. And they're like, yeah, I'll get heart disease when I'm 60. I don't care. Um, it's like, okay, fair, fair. But, uh, you know, we actually know there, there's a, a fun study that shows that in the six hours after eating, you know, some like saturated fat slash unhealthy fat bomb of a meal, like a big old breakfast burrito or fried chicken or pizza or whatever, um, that can, uh, in that six hour window after the meal, occlude blood flow, uh, by about 15 to 20%, including to the brain, which makes you dumber. Uh, so, so even in the short term, we know that those kind of things can, you know, have an impact on cognitive performance and we want to be mindful about that. So, um, I'd, I'd say that's, that's, you know, one of the big pitfalls is they're choosing these foods that are, um, functioning as a negative on their cognitive performance right before either scrims. Uh, right before or during scrims or or match plays, um, so that's that's a big one. Um, a lot of them are also chronically underhydrated, um, just not drinking enough water uh, at all. It's a lot of re- soda and juices and <laughs> energy drinks. I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of energy drinks. Uh, there's a lot of brand sponsorships and things like this for these orgs, and they will. Um, you know, they'll have a lot of powdered products. They'll have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sparkling kind of waters or flavored waters or, you know, those kind of things. Um, water is not the norm. Um, though all, all of them will say that they think water is important, but in my experience, but implementing is a different story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, more often than not, most people are under consuming, uh, fluids. And the, the fun thing about this that, you know, I can talk about the neurobiology of this, um, at, at the highest level, um, I, I would argue, especially in this, like, you know, your, your brain performance is, is really instrumental to your, uh, uh to your gaming performance. <laughs> uh, so your brain is, in, you know, instrumental to this. Um, when I was a kid, they told me your brain is, you know, or sorry, they told me your body is like two thirds water or something like that, or at least half your body's water. I was like, Oh, that's so cool. Um, but, and then when I was uh, learning neuro, um, my, my undergraduate degree was neurobiology. Um, I, we actually learned that the brain can be as much as 70 to 75% water. So it can be, you know, your brain is essentially like a big old water sponge and, um, as little as a 1% dehydration is all it takes before every single cognitive metric is significantly impaired. 
And from the data that I've collected over this last uh, several years, uh, what we've seen is that over half of esports players are coming into competition in a dehydrated state. So this is it's this is a really easy thing to get a leg up on the competition. Um, it, it's a linear decrease in performance. The the further you're dehydrated, the further your performances worsen. So it's like okay, one percent dehydration, you're this bad. Two percent dehydration, you're this bad. Three percent, you know, it just keeps going. Um, so that's that's another huge huge one, and we always I always try to work on that one sooner rather than later because uh, that one gets really good buy in. Uh, you can you can do it in twenty four to forty eight hours to adjust your hydration status. So that one is is really good. Um, I used to do this uh, sponge activity with our Aussie sports that are going to have impact, you know, especially like football. Yeah. I, I get a really big sponge and I get a really small sponge. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I dump the big sponge into some water. Yeah, and I'd say. First of all, I'd probably just throw them off. Like, what do you think this is? What do you think I'm trying to represent? And most kids yeah. like have no clue. Like, why are you holding up two sponges in your hand? Like, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. I go, well, think about this big sponge that I just put in the water as your brain. Yeah. I go, think about this dried out sponge that I've been having sitting on the windowsill for the last two weeks that I haven't touched that's dried <laughs> out. Yeah. Which one do you think you're probably going to have the highest chance or risk of getting a concussion for? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it's something like, oh, well, that dried up sponge, like it's really small. I go, yeah, like because the space and the your brain is going to get hit and be able to shift and to knock against your skull, it's going to be a higher impact, a higher risk concussion. So, yeah, to, right. Using visuals, using representations that are really going to like punch it forward or hit it forward towards them makes a big deal. And then as we went along throughout that season, right, it's, as I'm bringing in Gatorade water, putting it in the fridge in the locker room, right, like. Well, I got to make sure I get water. Like, I don't want to like be at a high risk for concussion. Right. And then, you know, if you get certain players start saying that now everybody's running over and get water. I'm like, I don't care if you got a joke about it. it if, if that's the joke for the whole entire season, yeah. but if that gets you to start drinking more fluids throughout the day, or at least up into the game to the best of our ability, yeah. then hopefully we try to mitigate that a little bit amongst a lot of different factors. Yeah. 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 I, I like that visual actually. I might, I might steal that also. Um, <laughs> they, they, um, uh, they, they meme on me, um, or on each other. They say, uh, uh cause on one, one of my slides, I'm like, I say, don't be a raisin brain. And so, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one too. Yeah. I say, I say, don't be a raisin brain. And, uh, then they, they always laugh at that and then, um, you know, joke about it. So, so that's a huge one. Um, you know, it's, it's just simply hydration status, which I see most of them are really, really struggling with. Um, uh, and, and then the, the, the last one that I'll mention is, well, there's probably two more that I, I mean, there's actually a lot of pitfalls, but uh, so I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention one more, which, which kind of ties into the the one in the, the pregame time period, which is simply um, a lot of people don't realize this. And I have to walk them through this exercise. You know, I ask them, I say, Hey, do you think you are a better player at the end of a scrim block? Or do you think you're a worse player at the end of the scrim block? And a lot of them say, Oh, I'm better. I learned. And, you know, I, I say, okay, well, let's carry this out. All right. So if you're better at the end of a scrim block, let's do a second scrim block right after that. No break. And then let's do a third one. Let's keep going. Let's keep doing this until, and then they're like, well, eventually, yeah, I'm going to pass out or, you know, because uh, you're just gonna be so exhausted. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, this is kind of like a dirty secret in neuroscience, which um, is immediately obvious. I feel like in, in a more physical realm, but is, you know, kind of loses its, its obviousness in the cognitive realm. But you're no better at the end of the stressor. You're actually worse at the end of the stressor. You've, you've damaged your brain. You've stressed it. You've depleted it of resources. Um, and the, the adaptation happens in the recovery from the stressor. It doesn't happen during the stressor itself. So, you, you know, you're weaker at the end of a gym session, right? You're not stronger at the end of the gym session. You have to, re you have to recover from that in order to, to get better and get stronger. And in a similar way, if you want to consolidate all that learning, you want to get that muscle memory going, you want your brain to be more resilient, whatever it is that you're going for, the recovery from the stressor is really, really instrumental for that adaptive capacity. And in order to adapt, in order to recover, in order to consolidate all this learning, all this kind of stuff, nutrition is really important, right? You know, there are other factors too, like you got to sleep. That's, that's probably number one, I would argue for this instance, but you also have to give it the right nutrients in order to make all that stuff be a reality. So you're already scrimming, you know, two, four hour blocks a day. Why would you shoot yourself in the foot and go have a six pack of beer and like go party the, the night after, right? Like there's there's no reason to do the, this craziness right after if you if you're trying to be serious and you're trying to get everything you can out of these sessions. Um, so so I like to talk about about you know the pre is important acutely, the post is uh, important chronically. Um, hydration matters all the time. 
Um, and then uh, the last one's probably supplements. I'll say is like the biggest pitfall. Every this population is smart. I swear they're so smart. Um, they know how to use. I said it last time. They know how to use Doctor Google and they know how to pull up a PubMed abstract and all this and that. Uh, but it's really problematic because these individuals are already prone to the quick fix. And so they get, they, they really want to believe that this particular stuff, especially if their favorite player, like they, you know, if the, if they see like, you know, some star player is using supplement X and it could just be like a sponsorship deal, right? Um, supplement X. And then they see their star players, you know, like, oh, I got to get on it, you know, FOMO through. <laughs> and so it's, it's um, yeah, it's real. It's very real. And, um, and then what you see is these people, they're, they're just, I mean, I, I see this in traditional sports too, though, you know, um, at the start of a season, I'm like, hey, bring me all your supplements. And then they come in with like three bags and like, here, check these out. Are these okay? You know, and <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's rough to go through all of it, but um, I think there's um, growing misinformation in the realm of nootropics and uh, cognitive supplements and cognitive enhancers and um, an over-reliance on these, especially things like caffeine to, to band-aid fix poor sleep patterns, which is also admittedly a huge issue for these individuals. Um, uh, and, and, and speaking on that note, just really quickly, um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but a lot of these individuals still they'll practice with their teams for like four hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon, um, and then they'll go home. And then they also, they try to have their own brand identity, their own, uh, you know, their own career outside of the team that they're on because they the people change teams all the time. So they want to really establish themselves as a dominant figure in the space uh, for, for their own business. And so a lot of them, what they do is they stream when they get home. And so they'll go home and they'll stream for another many hours, you know, and then they're, they're in bed at like, you know, two, three in the mornings. And, you know, it's, it's just a, it, it's, it's a, vicious kind of, cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's a very vicious cycle. And so then they end up relying on like caffeine the next day and all this and that it kind of spins out of control. Um, so anyway, sorry. Um, so there, there's a lot there, but, uh, anyway, that's, those are probably the most common pitfalls that I see. <laughs> so if they're, if they're home or like, let's say they're at their, their college or at their organization, then do you almost try to equip or recommend equipping their environment with like mini fridges or stuff near their gaming stations? Like, so that way, you know, if they are in the middle of a game or they're too lazy to get up or they don't want to do something like it's just turn around, I can just grab it right there. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, so it's going to depend on the budget, right? So that's always that conversation at the front end and what I can actually change and what I can't change. Um, if the budget's low, it's usually education based, right? That, cause that's all I can do. So they'll bring me in and they'll do like, okay, one, one team talk a month or some such, I don't know. Um, but some I've actually helped out with the facility design of some, some compounds um, and some teams, they also have what are called gaming houses. So it's like, it's just a, the team living in a, in a big house really. Um, now, if I have the luxury of altering the, the environment, environmental design, I think is definitely really important, especially in the realm of um, snacks and in hydration. So for the hydration, yeah, what I'll do is I'll try to put like a mini fridge, stock it with water in the actual room where they're gaming. Uh, so that way there's there's plenty available. Um, some teams, what I've done is we'll buy the entire team refillable water containers. Um, and then, you know, you'll, you'll have those. And then between games, uh, coaches or team managers are always there to be like, hey, I need you to take a sip of water between games. So like, we're always just like constantly encouraging it. Um, we want to make the, the, the healthy choice be the easy choice. So that's, that's really what it is. We try to make the easy choice be the healthy one and the unhealthy choice be the challenging one. Like if you want, you know, a, a candy bar or whatever, you got to like go downstairs, rummage through some shelves, get a ladder to get to the very top one. And then like, you know, reach behind and all this and that. We got to try to make it like really challenging for them to make the unhealthy choice. Um, but, but water's a huge one. So yeah, we'll stock it. Um, there was a facility where we ended up putting a refillable water container, um, sorry, refillable water dispenser, like a, basically a, a drinking fountain, but like with one of the ones where you can fill up the water. Um, we, we put that, we got the water line to go right next to the gaming room. So it was like, there's literally no excuse for you to just have nonstop water. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's absolutely something that we've done. Um, for some players, I've noticed that some of them don't like the taste of water. And there, I can think of several players like this where they just literally have not had a, a single drop of water in like years. And it's kind of nuts to me. They constantly need like flavoring. If it doesn't have flavoring, yeah. like it was like funny yeah. side story, but it's like my grandma. They're like, we well, yeah, used to have to buy her flavored water because she wouldn't yeah. drink water, regular yeah. water. She's like, it's got no taste. It doesn't taste. Really good. <laughs> I don't, don't want to drink it. We got her the flavored water. She's drinking like four to eight of those a day. We're like, 
it, whatever yeah. as long as it works <laughs> as long as it works yeah and so so yeah to that to that point um for for some of these teams we might stock just like little you know flavor water drops or um you know just like a sparkling water or just like a flavored water or like infused water like whatever it is if we can just get them to be drinking more more fluids um environmental design goes goes a long 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 way and then also trying to get support from the um the people who are there day in and day out like you know sometimes i'm there sometimes i'm not there but like the coaches and team managers and stuff who are there all the time, just having them echo the message also goes a really long way. Yeah. When you have the the support staff to be able to continue to keep saying the verbiage you're saying, like that's going to make a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I did at the last place I was at, you know, you mentioned a lot eating out yeah. Uber eats, all those different possible options that they have. It's like, I'm not going to be able to stop it. Like it's inevitable, like they're going to do it. So I just looked up 50 of the most common restaurants and fast food places and then i just made a document and made everything where you could just all right i want to go to eat chick-fil-a yep. they press the, the link on their phone all they have to go down is scroll chick-fil-a press that and it would like auto direct them down mm. to either the link and then and then pop up on their their phone or it would go down to the sheet that i had of like here's the best possible options yeah so then it's yeah. like all right here's 50 to 60 options and you're just two clicks and you're going right to where I'm telling you what the best options are. Like ah. it can't get much easier than that. <laughs> so, so you did something that uh, again, I might steal um, because I, I did something steals very steals for the day. You're on I know run. three, three steals, <laughs> man. It's the, it's the hat trick. Um, no, because, so, so the, uh, what I put together was I put together like a, like a takeout guide tier list for them for whatever city they're in. And I asked them, Hey, what are your top places that you're ordering from? And I, I collect all that and I pick out the best ones. And then what I did was um, I wrote next to each of these and, gamers love tier list which is why i did it in a tier list setup but um what, what, yeah what, what i did was um i wrote okay uh here's what you order here i did three options for per category i did uh three options for weight loss weight gain uh and then like cognitive performance so like a pre-game option or something like that so that way there's like okay if you're in this bucket you get this if you're in this bucket you get this if you're in this bucket you get this but um i I like making it even easier where like you can click and be like, all right, now it's like pre-populated or something um, in there. So I, I, I think that if, if that's feasible, I might be able to do that for some of these restaurants, but. I've even it, done like, you know, let's say an athlete, there's, there's something that's not on your list. Right. And they're yeah. like, hey, I'm going to go to this restaurant. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just pull up the menu, yeah. press screen record, scroll through the menu and yeah. then just talk. And then. <laughs> Hey, here's five awesome options you can stick or like, Hey, yeah. here's two really good protein, two good carbs, two yep. high quality vegetables. Um, if you pick these three things and make that into a plate, cool. Definitely order from that restaurant or that place. Like that's going to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. I've um, yeah, I've, I've definitely do a lot of menu review for these individuals just because if it's the, the coaches or them or whatever. Um, and for whatever reason, I'll say uh, gamers love Chipotle. Like I think Chipotle, everybody loves Chipotle. <laughs> Chipotle is is crazy popular. Yeah, I mean, I guess everybody loves Chipotle. I love Chipotle, but it's crazy popular. Um, I had a lot of, yeah, every single player I know frequents Chipotle. <laughs> uh, Chipotle and Chick Fil A are probably the two most popular spots I would say for um LA right now. <laughs> yeah, I think that's almost nationwide. To be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Um. So you mentioned supplements. Yep. What are maybe your your, your go-to top three supplements, neurotropics, you know, that you found via research and implementation um, to possibly have the best effect if the athlete's doing all the things you need to, right? Like if they're sleep, yeah. having good quality sleep yeah. and eating well and they're, they're hydrating, right? Because we know if we don't do those things as the base, it's going to be very hard to add the one percenters on top to may actually make that one percent, make you one percent better. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, the obvious one, the most well-researched one is caffeine, right? And and I am an advocate for caffeine when used strategically. And so you mentioned a lot of caveats there. And I think if all of those boxes are checked, then caffeine can be used quite successfully in an esports population. Um, it's the most widely used psychoactive compound in the world, and it's the most widely researched psychoactive compound in the world. We have tremendous amounts of data behind it and its impact on cognitive faculties. Um, one of the obvious ones for gamers, which it can help out with is a boost in reaction time. Okay. Almost everyone can use that. Um, it does a lot of other interesting things like increases in spatial and perceptual memory, uh, you know, reductions in fatigue and all this and that kind of stuff. Um, so there are some really cool things that caffeine can do for you. But the thing that I want to highlight for that is 
caffeine doesn't work for everybody. I mean, it does work for the, you know, the, in the sense that, uh, if you're using it because of poor sleep, um, it can band-aid fix the poor sleep, regardless of whoever you are, just based off of its mechanism, but for the cool, you know, Oh, I want to go from hundred to 110%, you know, in my cognition, you, you have to be, uh, the, there are extra caveats for it. Um, and, um, some people will get benefit from it. Some people will see no benefit and some people actually get worse when they take caffeine. Um, it's not, it's not just, Oh, let's just put everybody on this and assume it's going to work out. Uh, some people have very bad reactions to caffeine and, you know, they get anxious, they get jittery and their performance is worse. So you have to be very careful about that and, you know, be mindful that you're not just blasting a team with it, which I've seen a lot of them do where they're just like, Oh, everybody gets an energy drink before game day. It's like, well, that's, oh. <laughs> that's, that's not the right move at all. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, so, so like I've seen that and that, that makes me uh, sad when I see it. And a lot of gamers have this mindset about it, but um, in general, I would say a lot of people who are natural avoiders of caffeine already, like they're just like, Oh, I don't drink it. Those are the people who tend to have the negative reactions to it. Um, so for caffeine, um, there is a well-known nootropic stack with it. It's the most widely researched nootropic stack, which is caffeine plus L-theanine. And this is, uh, they basically, it, it kind of, it's true. Um, it, it sort of has a, this magical one plus one equals three, um, scenario going on where, uh, you know, it's the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, uh, in short, um, L-theanine takes the edge off of the caffeine while still maintaining most of the upside. So you, you pair those two things and you see, um, good, pretty, pretty substantial, um, increases in, um, in cognition. Um, the, the other thing that I'll mention about caffeine is you, a lot of these individuals are blasting their bodies with it every single day. And it only works if you're caffeine sensitive, if you are caffeine habituated and you take the same dose or less of what you're used to taking, all you're doing is staving off withdrawal. You are not using it for strategic improvement. So, uh, typically what you would want to do is you would want to cycle your caffeine if possible. Uh, and the, the, the minimum time to, to get some resensitization back for caffeine is, uh, two days. So if you did like two days with a reduced dose of caffeine, and then on that high value day, you gave yourself the higher, um, regular dose. Um, that's, that's how you can do it. And if you want to do like a full, full washout, it, it takes at, it takes about three weeks to do a full, full, full caffeine, like resensitization. But I know I'd go crazy if I did three weeks with no caffeine. <laughs> yeah, um, they would say the same yeah, thing. yeah. So, um, and then the dose that we use for a single cognitive task is anywhere from a one to three mix per kg body weight. Um, so, so I love those. Um, that's a, that's a great stack. Um, and then there's two other ones that I'll just very briefly mention, cause I know we're almost up, up on time, but the, um, uh, one of them is creatine, which you could probably talk about. Um, you know, there's tremendous and like really, you know, it's, there's basically zero downside to taking it and there's only potential upside. And while it hasn't, it doesn't have as much data in like a gaming population. We can pull data from other areas where we we've seen that it can help out with uh, various aspects of cognition, um, resilience, you know, to stressors and injury and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and so I, I'm huge, 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 huge fan of creatine uh, for this population. And so I usually end up recommending it. And then the the last little one that I like to recommend is, uh, which is going to sound silly, but it's probably pretty basic, is just fish oil. So, uh, the, the human brain, you know, if we dehydrate it, it is the fattiest organ we have outside of pure fat tissue. So, um, outside of, you know, being water, it's like a water plus fat <laughs> and the, the raw structural components of the brain are composed of these healthy fats, um, of which DH DHA is a significant contributor and your brain, despite, you know, despite what some people claim, um, is undergoing significant change, um, across the entire lifespan. There are areas in the brain that are, that are undergoing chain, literally, you know, new neurogenesis is occurring in the entire lifespan in certain areas of the brain. Um, but, uh, let, let's pretend, you know, cause they're all, uh, let's, let's omit that for a sec. Um, in this population, which slants young, there's still significant brain growth occurring up until, you know, 20s, 30s, right? So you want to make sure that the raw hardware of the brain is built appropriately. And this will give you a longer term edge if you are eating a lot of those healthier fats. So for those who are relying on convenience foods, they're usually not eating a lot of fish. Uh, so I end up recommending the fish oil supplement to just try to help them out a little bit. But if we can do a diet modification, I would rather do it that way. One last quick one before we, we jump off yeah. here. <laughs> Beetroot juice. Beetroot juice. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So this is funny because there's actually a lot of, um, I I'm a huge fan of products that can enhance blood flow. And a lot of the ones that are good for cardio performance because they improve blood flow to your muscles are also good for cognitive performance because it improves blood flow to the brain beetroot juice. I would be a huge fan. I haven't had any player who's sold on it though. And they think it tastes nasty, but, um, there are other products that do something similar. So, um, I will tell them, yeah, eat beets, eat arugula. Here's a beetroot, whatever they hate it. They're not going to do it, but a lot of berry products can also improve cerebral blood flow. So like a blueberry, uh, it doesn't have to even be blueberries. Um, and then I'll also mention too, like dark chocolate improves ocular blood flow, which improves hand-eye coordination, which is kind of cool too. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of fun stuff that can improve blood flow. And I know we're like literally seconds away from finishing, but anyway, yeah, there's t- if you want to do like a part three on supplements, I, have alone, to do I, part could, three. I, I can, I can, I can so talk about that. From first. <laughs> there's so much more information we go in and like, you're just, yeah. a, you're just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but if anyone is looking to get those supplements, you can go down into my bio, um, get uh, money off on either Thorn or design for sports. Um, anything else that you need, go hit that bio link. Uh, 